Thank you, Diane, and thank you, Trevor. As always, thank you. Uh, what an honor it is to be here. Thank you all for coming out. Really appreciate it. Um, you know, you could ask the question, why in the world am I doing this? 67 years old, because I took an oath in August of 1970 in a Marine Corps office, raised my hand to the Constitution of the United States and said I would preserve, protect, and defend it against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and bear true faith and allegiance to the same. And that oath never had an expiration date. And I am more committed to its fulfillment now even than I was then because at that time I didn't see the threat that I see now. And folks, my wife and I just started a school in our church. I am a pastor. I preach every Sunday morning. Uh, my wife and I just started a school in our church and we've called it the Maximum Potential Academy because we understood that trying to help children escape the cultural pathologies and anomalies that hold them down and hold them back. You know, ben Carson recently said poverty is a spirit and of course the mainstream media just went crazy. You know, who is it? What is, what is he talking about? Well, he was talking about that set of attitudes and ideas that keeps people locked in poverty. And during one of the sessions we were having with the children, um, we got to talking about travel, and one of them mentioned that they wanted to go to Paris. And, and I said, well, you know, that'd be great to visit Paris. I said, you, you have to understand, and this, this is a kid about uh, 11 years old, 10 or 11 years old. You have to understand that you be visiting, you won't be a citizen of Paris. And you know what the response, I said, you're a citizen of the United States. You know what the response was? What's a citizen? <laughs> That's why half of our millennials prefer socialism over capitalism because they're not being taught anything about what it means to be an American. In fact, they're being taught a polemic against America. A young man from the Navy was a member of my church for several years because, of course, we're right. Uh, there in the Norfolk area and the largest naval base in the world is there and he came through our church and he was there for I don't know maybe three years two or three years and before he left he said I want to thank you for something I said what's that he said believe it or not when I joined this church I hated my country he said here I am serving the Navy in the Navy but I hated my country he said and I hated it because somebody introduced me to a book by Zen called A People's History of the United States. He said, and that thing embittered me and made me feel like America's a terrible place, a horrible place. And, and folks, this stuff is not happening by accident. This is by design. Because there are people who don't like this country for what it represents, <clears throat> and what it's been to us and to the world, and they want to change it. Now, Karl Marx theorized that communism would come by violent revolution, that you had to overthrow the bourgeoisie. But Antonio Gramsci, who Trevor has alluded to several times, came around with a different theory. He was born in 1891, died in 1937, but he wrote a great deal and his attitude was, and I really believe that he, he came to this by observing the United States of America, that no, 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 you can't overthrow a country like the United States with violence. What you have to do is you have to subvert it from within. You have to take over the cultural institutions of that country. You have to change what he called cultural hegemony. You subvert the culture, you change attitudes, you change ideas, you change what people believe, and they will embrace communism on their own. Sound familiar? Because that's exactly what's happened in our country. And really, I think it began long before the 60s, but it accelerated during the 60s. And really, what he basically said was, you don't need to, as violent communists once did, you don't need to force people not to believe in God, what you do is you redefine who God is and what he wants. 
I was trying to hold an event in Richmond, Virginia one time, and we had found a church that would open its doors to us, and I got a call from them a few days after we had secured it, and they said, well, we're not allowing you to come. And I said, well, why not? They said, we found out who you are. <laughs> and I said, well, what do you mean? They said, we're not letting somebody in our church who believes that two gay men or gay women should not be able to get married. And we're not letting anybody into our church who will deny a woman's right to choose. And we're not letting anybody into our church who is a conservative or a Republican. You're not coming in here. Of course, I ultimately said, well, I thought you were a church, so now that I know you're not, I don't want to come. <laughs> but think about that, folks. Even conservative denominations are being infiltrated right now. So look, you know if you can convince people, as is being argued now, that Jesus was a socialist. <laughs> yeah. Uh, people are complaining about this pope. Or you can, you can convince them that liberation theology is really what the Bible teaches. And, and, and liberation theology, as we know, is nothing but Marxism clothed in Christian language. That's all it is. So you don't, you don't need to, to, to say, well, you can't believe in God. You can simply change what that means, and you've still got them. So you don't really need to close the church. Church, you just, you just change its mission. Church is supposed to be about personal salvation, a relationship with God, righteous living, right? Redemption. No, 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 no. The church is about social justice. You see? You don't, you don't need you, Castro and, and many communist revolutions imprisoned and killed intellectuals. No need to do that. You just raise up a crop of them that believe all the garbage that you want them to believe. And that's exactly what we've got in our country right now. Our colleges and universities are filled with them. Sadly, our public schools are filled with them. And you know, Marx said that the family was a, 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 a promoter of the bourgeois values that needed to be overthrown. Well, you don't need to get rid of the family anymore. You just redefine what it is. It's no longer a mother and a father raising children. You know, now it can be anything people want it to be. And, and by the way, you don't have to propagate the values that make our culture work of, of individual responsibility and individual liberty and, and, and personal work ethic and, and personal morality and integrity and decency towards your neighbor. You don't need the government to tell you how to treat your neighbor. You, you treat other people the way you want to be treated. But that we didn't have to have the government tell us to do that. Tell people all the time, when, the, when, when I take money out of my pocket and give it to you, that's compassion. But when the government reaches in my pocket and takes my money and gives it to whom it thinks worthy, no matter what I think, that's not compassion, that's compulsion. But see, we're teaching people, no, 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 that's, that's true compassion. Because if you're truly compassionate, you'll let the government take whatever it wants. Who is it? Uh, I think it's uh, Elizabeth Warren, or is it Bernie Sanders? But they're, they're proposing large, very, very high tax levels, because after all, that's what it's going to take for us to be compassionate toward others. So you just, you just subvert everything. You change the meaning of everything. Um, one Marxist theorist called it cultural terrorism. I mean, we had a, a guy in West Point, Virginia, who had a kid brought to him who was told, this was a boy, he's now a girl, or vice versa. And he was told that from this point forward, this is an English teacher, was told, you will now refer to him, not as he or she, but as they. And he said, well, I teach grammar. Why would I call a singular person by a plural pronoun? They fired him. Kelvin Cocker is a friend of mine. He was the, the uh, chief of the fire department for Atlanta. And Kasim Reed, the black mayor, found out that Kelvin Cocker not was doing anything on the job as fire chief, but that he was a member of a church and he was going around speaking at churches, affirming marriage as a union between one man and one woman. He was reported for having done so, and the mayor suspended him from his job for bigotry. And then after investigating, fired him. Now ultimately, he did win. Uh, the, the city ultimately paid him, compensated him, because they said he was discriminated against for his religious beliefs. But, but by that time, his career was over. 
mean, th this is this is cultural terrorism, folks. This is, in fact, look, we're not living in a state of of governmental totalitarianism, but we're already living in cultural totalitarianism right now. Because if a person works for a corporation and they dare express biblical or conservative values or God forbid, express support for Donald Trump, you're probably gonna lose your job. Or you're certainly not going to get promoted. You're gonna get shut it aside. Google did a seminar on family and because the guy doing the seminar didn't acknowledge the many permutations there are of family today, they had an uprising at Google saying, well, he's a bigot and a hater, and, and Google had to apologize and bring somebody else in who would talk about family as it's now defined today. Drew Brees just endorsed the idea of children taking their Bibles to school and was suddenly attacked as a bigot and a hater. Folks, we're living in cultural totalitarianism now. Right. The only difference is they don't have control of the state primarily because of President Donald Trump and the work that you all do on the ground. But we've got to make sure that they never have it because I'll tell you something, if they ever get full control of the government, the kind of control they want, I don't believe that there's any limit to the depths to which they sink and how they treat us. They call us haters. We are not haters. I mean, I, look, I, I'm, a, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. I don't hate anybody. I don't hate my worst enemy. I don't hate the person who disagrees with me. I hate their ideas. I hate their policies, and the Bible teaches me I'm supposed to hate what is false. I'm supposed to hate what is untrue. But I don't hate them, but they hate us with a passion. I remember when Kim Davis, little cute, cute little woman, wouldn't sign a, a certificate of marriage for two homosexuals, and, and she ultimately was, of course, put in jail by the judge uh, for contempt of court, and they reveled in it. They reveled in her sitting in prison. They thought it was great. They talked about it on Twitter. They loved it. Because they want to see us suffer. They want to see us in pain. They want to see us destroyed. And folks, if we don't stand up for what we know is true and right and good, it's not just about us. But at my age, I'm thinking now about our grandchildren and what kind of America they're going to grow up in and whether they will know the freedom that we have enjoyed. We've got to make sure that we are standing up for what we know is right because this stuff has insinuated itself and infiltrated our culture in such a way that the future is in my view in doubt. I think it's in our hands, but it is clearly in doubt. Ronald Reagan said, freedom is never more than one generation from extinction. We do not pass it on to our children in the bloodstream. It must be fought for and protected and passed on to them to do the same. We will spend our sunset years telling our children about the United States of America, where once we were free. We cannot allow that to happen. Uh, we've got to be absolutely committed to the values that we know made America the greatest nation on earth. And by the way, the, all this racial stuff, folks, it's right out of the Marxist playbook. Because look, here's the thing. You can't convince people. Marx thought that all of life can be understood as class warfare. But you know, you can't sell that in America because people are so upwardly mobile. I was born into a broken home. My wife was raised in the projects. I was born into poverty. My father had a third, a, a sixth grade education, was a third class welder in Sunship Building and Dry Dock Company. I spent the first 10 years of my life in foster care because of my parents being broken up and my father finally came and took custody of me, custody of me at the age of 10 years old. So I didn't have an easy life, but my father watched me graduate from Harvard Law School. He watched me become a lawyer. He watched me do things he could never imagine doing. But that's America, folks. That's America. And by the way, this is a message we need to carry to all these socialists. We don't need more government spending and we don't need a government program. The thing we need more than anything else to bring stability back to our societies, we need to get fathers back in the homes, we need to get the family strengthened, and we need to get people believing that the family is the key institution in society. And, and, and so, look, 
we've got to help people understand what is going on and that's what stand against communism about is about we started this several months ago uh, because we felt that Americans are not sufficiently alarmed they're not you know the more I study this and the more I learn about it from researchers and we've got other people with us uh, Trevor is our key guy but Jerome Corsi is with us and and Alan West is with us and uh, Diane West is with us um, Reverend Rafael Cruz who escaped Castro's Cuba is part of our coalition uh, but this stuff is deep in our culture um, I've been reading the biographies of presidents just to try to understand how we got to where we are and how presidential leadership has played a role did you know that when Bill Clinton was in England and was about to leave thinking that he was going to ultimately have to serve in the military and go to Vietnam because he wasn't about to resist the draft because he had political ambitions and he thought it would ruin them. Not because he loved the country, but because he just knew politically he couldn't afford to be labeled a draft dodger. So when he left England thinking he would never come back, he went and visited the sites that he thought most important. And this is from his own memoir. You know one of the places he thought was important to visit? The grave of Karl Marx. Now my wife and I are planning a trip to Europe for our 50th anniversary and you know Karl Marx is not on the itinerary. <laughs> I mean think about that. Uh, uh, Trevor alluded to it. But out of Jerome, uh, 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 not Jerome, uh, um, uh, James Comey's own lips, he says when he was interviewed before being appointed U.S. Attorney, the first big appointment he got, he said that he was a communist. And he said to the reporter, I don't know what I am now. He said, I guess I lean kind of toward Republican policies. But he admitted that he was a communist. John Brennan, the first vote he ever took for president, he voted for Gus Hall, the chairman of the Communist Party USA. I mean, folks, this stuff is deep. You go to New York and the Bronx right now, uh, there's a place called Forest uh, Houses that is a project and right in the middle of the project, they've got a monument to Antonio Gramsci. I mean, this, this stuff is, has insinuated itself all over our country in ways that we don't even begin to notice. Because here again, this is the process. It's not violence. Now, they've always got that threat out there, don't get me wrong. But it's primarily with the subtle insinuation into the culture, so, so like the frog in the kettle. And it just boils hotter and hotter and hotter. And by the time the frog notices, he's already cooked. And you know, we're almost already cooked. And we just got to make sure that, okay, this is it. We're going to kick the kettle over. <laughs> this, this is not going to be allowed uh, to continue. And so, folks, this whole thing of liberation, theology, and, and, and racism, let me come back to that for a second. This is Antonio Gramsci's way of... of replicating the class warfare that doesn't work in America. Because many of you, like me, you start from nowhere and you can, you can become anything you want to be in this country. I mean, you know, when I hear the complaints from people like um, Colin Kaepernick, and don't get me started on him, but, um, you know, because anytime you're worth a hundred million dollars and you won't stand up for the flag of the country that made it possible for you to become a multi-millionaire running around on a grassy field throwing a leather ball, buddy, something's wrong with your brain. Somebody got to make you stand up. But, um, look, race is the new class warfare. You see, because... You can't sell class warfare when people like you and me start poor and end up wealthy, end up doing very well. But if you can convince people that race is the injustice, then no matter how well they're doing, you can maintain that bitterness and that anger and that hatred and that frustration. You know, I hear people like Spike Lee, who lives in a multi-million dollar mansion, is worth probably a couple hundred million dollars, talk about how angry he is. And I'm thinking, angry about what? And, and you know, LeBron James even talks about how, how difficult it is to be a black man in America. Living in a gigantic mansion worth almost a billion dollars today. And folks, if they lived anywhere, I asked Trevor about this. I said, well, how much do the sports players 
in New Zealand make? He said, well, if, if they make a few hundred thousand dollars, they're really doing well. They've hit it big time. And here these athletes get multi hundreds of million dollar contracts. And they're running around complaining because somebody's convinced them that, oh, oh, America's, America's racist. They're all out to get you. And by the way, folks, let me tell you how absurd this is. And don't you all be afraid to stand up. If anybody says anything to you, you come to me. I'll, I'll fight for you. But look, you know how absurd this is? When they look at me and say, I'm a white supremacist, you know it's going off the rails. You know, I said, I grew up in the 60s. I never thought the day would come when I would be defending white people. Because th this, this stuff is sick. It's sick. The, the very thing that we were supposed to be ending, they're now reversing and turning it around. But this is a Marxist play. This is exactly what they have in mind to keep us balkanized, to keep us divided. Uh, I started staying, by the way, when Barack Obama got elected president because I knew that our country was in trouble then. I started staying, staying true to America's national destiny because I knew he wouldn't. And, and I had people say to me, as you as a black man ought to be supporting the black president. I, I would tell them, well, first of all, since he doesn't support my Jesus and doesn't support my God, I'm not supporting him. That's number one. But number two, I never believed that Barack Obama loved America. Think about it. I never heard him once speak about this country with any affection or any passion or, or any love or about our people. I mean, the only thing he knew to do was go to foreign countries and criticize our country and tell everybody what we weren't. And what he doesn't realize that the only reason he was able to become the leader of the free world, so to speak, was because of the decency of the American people who wanted to give somebody, even somebody like him, a chance. And I'll tell you what, I've said to people who voted for him, you can repent, that's one sin I didn't commit. <laughs> So, folks, we, we've got to stand up. Stand Against Communism was formed several months ago to do just that, to do two things, essentially. Number one, awaken the American people, because you are all aware of this. That's why you're here. But you know what? Most of our fellow citizens aren't. They don't get it. I tell them, this is not business as usual. This is not a policy difference. Let me tell you something, folks. This impeachment thing, this is not about a conversation with the Ukrainian president. This is about the fact that they hate you and me so much for having voted President Trump in, and they so disrespect and disregard our legitimate electoral process that they want to overthrow him. They want to get rid of him. And folks, communists never respect elections unless they go their way. And that's exactly what we've got going now. They don't respect the election that got him uh, put into office. And, and, and you're right, Trevor, if this election in 2016, this president getting elected, drove them up the wall, and you know, a lot of them threatened to leave if he got elected, let's make them keep their promise and elect him again, okay? To say, please go, please go. Uh, somebody asked me about this. I talked about this earlier, and I didn't give this site, but somebody asked me about this. On, on August 24th, the Democrat National Committee had their summer meeting in San Francisco. They passed a resolution saying, we praise the values of the religiously unaffiliated. They are the largest religious group within the, Demo they call them a religious group, within the Democratic Party and that the religiously unaffiliated Americans overwhelmingly share the Democrat Party's values and we should advocate for rational public policy based on sound science and universal humanistic values and they criticize the Republicans for embracing religious people. So they're coming out with it now. I mean, it's just open. You can, you can Google that yourself. August 24th, a resolution praising the religiously unaffiliated. You know what that means? You Christians, shut up. Sit down. Get out of our way. Because we've got a plan for our country, this country that you all don't like, and we're gonna get it implemented whether you like it or not. And you know what, folks, we need to be saying? No, not on our watch. Not on our watch. It's not going to happen. <laughs> folks, 
hope you all share this with me and I'll be done. I said to God, I want to live long enough to see this country turned around. And I'm going to do everything in my power to help make that happen. I don't care what it costs me. I don't care what it takes. You know, they, um, this the communist group uh, out in, uh, I think it was Denver, uh, went to the home of the warden of the ICE uh, camp that where they hold a lot of these illegal immigrants. And they've been going around to the homes of these wardens and threatening them and threatening their families uh, and, and chanting. Let me see if I can find this stupid chant. No borders, no nations, no racist de deportations. Let them all in. Close the concentration camps. Folks, these people have lost it. They have completely lost it and then threatened and, and then chanted this. We know who you are, we know what you do, and we know where you live. I mean, if you do what I do, you're going, you're going to get threatened. You're going to get harassed. I've had people write me letters. I had one guy write me a letter saying, uh, don't come to California because what you're going to be, be met with won't be a welcome. Oh, I've already been several times. <laughs> you know what I said? Look, folks, I believe in Jesus Christ. If they kill me, it's a promotion. <laughs> But I don't believe I don't believe they can do anything to me until I'm done the work I have here to do. And my attitude is this: if I have to be the last person on earth, the last person in this country standing up for that flag, the last one standing up for that constitution, the last one standing up for what this country represents and who we are, I will do it until I breathe my dying breath, but I will never give up. I will never give in. I will never back down. I will never turn this country over to a bunch of Marxists and socialists and communists to destroy this nation. We're going to make America, make sure that America remains the land of the free and the home of the brave. And look, we're, we're going to see to it that generations coming behind us will feel what we feel when that national anthem comes on. This is why I get so angry when people disrespect it, because I feel something when that national anthem plays. When we, I, I, I watch people when, when it's time to salute the flag, and I, I watch people stiffen their backs and stand up, because we know that flag is not just a piece of cloth. It represents the blood the sacrifice of so many who have gone before us and made it possible for us to enjoy the freedom that we enjoy in this nation. Look, my ancestors were slaves and sharecroppers in Orange County, Virginia. But as far as I'm concerned, they made a sacrifice that would allow their great grandson to experience the greatest level of freedom and opportunity and hope that any people anywhere else on the world would ever receive. Folks, there is no better place on earth for anybody to live, regardless of the color of their skin, than the United States of America. And I want generations to come behind us to feel what I feel when that national anthem plays, when, that, when the, those colors go up, when we sing those old patriotic hymns, my country tis of thee. Sweet land of liberty of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride from every mountainside. Let freedom reign. And you know, I, I love those songs because they move my heart because I know what I could have been had I been born somewhere else, had I been given some other destiny. But my destiny was to be an American. And I tell you, I'm glad about that. And that last verse of that song says who we are and why we are who we are. It's a prayer. Our Father's God to thee, author of liberty, to thee we sing. Long may our land be bright with freedom's holy light. Protect us by thy might. Great God, our King. We're going to fight, and we want you all to fight with us. Sign up, be a part of Stand Against Communism. 
We can't come here and fight this fight for you, but we can certainly provide you with information and inspiration and help of whatever kind we can give uh, in order to help make sure that we save New Hampshire because we got to save New Hampshire as part of the pathway towards saving America. So God bless each and every one of you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for the fight you're in. God bless New Hampshire. God bless the United States of America. Rock TV.